Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and I generally try to lead you through the maze of whatever we're doing on this show. Um, as you know, Get Used to It generally every month does a show of things that might be of interest about and to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community and their allies, which I hope is everyone in the world. Today we have something really special for you. Um, occasionally we do a one-on-one -on -one interview of uh, a person that we really want you to know better. We call it Voices of Our Lives, a very clever title. And today I am incredibly pleased to uh, have on my show uh, an actress, a raconteur, uh, <laughs> one greatest American humorist since Mark Twain, um, and uh, my personal goddess, Lily Tomlin. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Lily. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So what we generally do in Voices of Our Lives is try to get an idea of, you know, kind of where people came from. Um, so if you don't mind, just sort of the standard beginning, uh, where were you born? Detroit. D Detroit. Inner city. And your family was? They're from Kentucky, came up to work, you know, in the factories. In, like, making cars? Yeah. And is My mom didn't work because my dad didn't want her to work. You don't, women didn't work in those days, you know, unless they were, um, I don't know, Unless they had to, right? <laughs> you know, they had to work. Well, my uh, mom was the same, and she worked in a factory when she was like uh, eleven. Well, my mom did work in down in the south. She worked in a button factory. Uh -huh. But when she came and after she married my dad, he didn't want her to work. You know, right. it's a it's a uh, emblem of pride uh, for a working class guy in those days. His wife didn't work. Eventually, she worked when I was about twelve as a nurse's aide. Uh huh. So your interest in healthcare began very early. Yes, it did. It, oh, it truly did. <laughs> well, everybody's did. It's like the first time they got sick, I think they thought, oop, there's something going on here. No, I remember my tonsillectomy when I was five. I remember it vividly. Yeah? Yeah. So, Why? Well, because it was an unusual experience. In those days, you know, they put a, a little piece of rubber over your eyes and they gave you ether. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I was sure, and I, I was, I, anyway, just, I was hypochondriacal as a kid. I used to read medical, home medical counselors, you know, partly because I liked the plastic overlays with all the body parts, <laughs> and, you know. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then I also liked to read about diseases. I just was sort of fascinated by diseases, the idea that you could be uh, gestating uh, some um, organism for years before you knew you had the disease. Uh -huh, it's a strange fascination, Lily, but yeah, we're I not know, surprised. It sounds like it is, but I, I, I don't think it was. I just thought it was interesting. And were you born Lily Tomlin? Born Mary Jean. My mother's name was Lily. Uh -huh. And I, I always, my dad's name was Guy. So I always thought they had great, the best show business names, <laughs> Lily and Guy. And I, I wanted to get my brother to change his name to Guy. I changed <laughs> mine to Lily. I mean, I didn't change it legally, but you know, and one day down in the village, they were looking for English uh, performers for a, a cabaret thing. Uh -huh. And so I said, we'll go down and we'll pretend, we'll say we're Lily and Guy Tomlin and talk with an English <laughs> accent. And, <laughs> and as a result, I, I didn't get in that show, but I did get in a mime show. Huh. But not, anyway. Well, I, I want to get to the village because, was, of course, you know, how you get from Detroit to the village is an, is an interesting thing, too. But, I, but so you know, if I start brother? talking, it'll be forever. And we like forever. I have a baby brother. He's four, almost four years younger. What's his real name, not Guy? Richard. Uh -huh. Richard. Is he, uh, does he live uh, He lives on the in West Nashville. Coast? Oh, Nashville. He'd prefer to live on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> but he's living in Nashville, and he has lived there for several years. His partner lives there. Uh-huh. And uh, is from Kentucky also, which, uh, same origins of my parents. And uh -huh. In fact, my mother knew Michael, his partner, when uh, he was a little bag boy at the supermarket. Wow. When he was about 12. He's younger than my brother, about so 20 So when did years. your family move to Detroit? Because you were born there. And born then in Detroit. My mother and dad came up, you know, sometime after they'd married. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess I was born there a year or two later. So did you stay there long enough to start school there? Oh, no, in Detroit. I lived yeah. my whole life in Detroit. Oh, I see. Until I went summers to, to Kentucky uh -huh. and stayed on the farm. And then I'd come back and I'd live in inner city Detroit. I lived in a predominantly black neighborhood. Uh -huh. And uh, so I had a lot of experience with humanity. Uh huh. I lived in an old apartment house with every kind of person you can imagine. Was it, did you like your childhood or were you, was it scary? I think or? I loved it. No, yeah. see, that's the thing. I. Uh, people try to force me into, uh, you know, uh, uh, disavowing my childhood, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a hard time to do it. I mean, uh -huh. my dad was out, was an alcoholic, uh -huh. and died when he was only 56. But it was never a big deal to me, you know. I'm sure other kids raised in that environment, they think it's uh, horrific. I hear kids say, you know, very somber and, and tragically that they're, they're one or both of their parents were alcoholic. 
My dad was a fairly benign alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I guess that's maybe the difference. But mm -hmm. he was sober all week. He my father was a very hard worker, mm -hmm. and uh, but he did go on benders on the weekends, and mm -hmm. he uh, and I would go the track with him. I go the bookie joints with him, and uh, huh. you know I was I rather liked I liked as much of life as I could get a hold of. You know. Now where do you think that comes from? I have no. It's I interesting. Don't. You say you know you're reading like medical books and you're and, and marriage lots man of very big on marriage manuals. I'd go. <laughs> we didn't have a marriage manual in our house, but uh, was a marriage neighbors manual did. a sex manual or? It tells you how to you know, how to copulate, you know, in different positions. Well, and I could understand being interested in that. Yeah, I mean, well, that's on. a marriage a marriage manual is about is mostly about sex, uh -huh. behaving sexually, you know, and behaving in the right, you know, some um, accommodating way, I guess. Uh huh. And for satisfying girls, anyway. way. Yes, right. Yeah. Or to do it right. Yeah. So did you go to public schools in Detroit? Oh, public schools, sure. Neighborhood schools. I went one block, one way was my grade school, and one block the other way was my junior high. And uh, <laughs> in this old building we lived in, my brother and I, my mother had, my mother was sort of a, a vacuum cleaner uh, fanatic. She liked vacuum cleaners. And <laughs> of course, she was preyed on by all the vacuum cleaner salesmen that would come to the door. Of course. And I would find, forever be finding some old, you know, uh, Kirby, they told, sold Kirby's door to door. Right. And I knew that it was a, it would be trouble for my mom because she couldn't pay for them. There mm -hmm. were just too many. But they would talk her into buying them and they tell you, you know, if you get 10 of your friends to buy one, yours will be free. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> like you have 10 friends who can afford to buy this Kirby, which cost about $300 in those days. Oh my God. They were really expensive. And so I'd find another poor old vacuum cleaner, you know, and I'd try to, I'd try to salvage the situation. I'd say, <laughs> let me see the contract, Mom. And if, I knew if it wasn't 72 hours or there was some law that you could re rescind the contract. And I would always try to do that in time. But <laughs> wait, what did I start to tell you, damn it? Oh, my brother. So we had always had vacuum cleaners and vacuum cleaner hoses, you know, that go from tank type right, vacuums. Right, sure. So my brother and I would uh, come when we were still going to the same grade school before I left shortly after he started, you know, because I was older. But we'd come home from school and there'd always be some tough kid, you know, harassing us or something like that. And we'd run upstairs. To, we lived in the second floor apartment by this time. We uh -huh. went from the basement to the first floor to the second floor, which was bigger. And uh, so we would drop the hose out the window <laughs> of this upstairs apartment. And it was Tweety, so it would sort of match the bricks, you know. And we'd wait for the, the tough kids to be coming by. And then we'd shout, shout down, you know, we're going to kick your ass, you know. <laughs> and the kids would, like, turn and look around. And, you know, of course, that was... I would give, I'd give you that taste of that just to give you an idea of my little brother. Well, I get it. His idea. I was thinking you were dropping things through that door, you know, if or turning the vacuum on backwards, you know, if <laughs> yeah, all the well dirt that, goes out. That's too reasonable. Yeah, I guess so. So, um, were you a performer from the beginning? Uh, I yeah, mean, pretty much, I think. I, I put on shows. I can see you being full of personality at the age of four. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah? I think I liked everything so much, you know. I, I think I was really kind of in love with... Uh, being uh, in that apartment house and being in my neighborhood, and then going to the going to Kentucky in the summers and and seeing all the cultural differences and and, uh, and of course I was very big on we my cousins too farm kids are you know just out there someplace on a biological level uh -huh. and they uh, <laughs> you know when animals or goats were copulating or cows or anybody you know in the field because of big farms there'd be a, we'd set up a cry and you'd run to a certain field or you know wherever the <laughs> action was on, going on and I would go back to this was in kindergarten I would go back and draw what I'd seen and and so it's that theatrical sense you know of knowing that you're shocking or you're titillating or and because the because the adults react so strongly you know they're they're amused they're they're they sort of are taken aback but in, a, in an amused way and um, and they treat you as if you're innocent and you don't quite know what you've done. And what about the other kids? Do they flock to that or I think kind they, of you're weird? Well, or? I didn't care. I had no desire to be friends with my peer group. Uh -huh. I much preferred my teacher. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> uh, Miss Margaret Ann Sweeney was my most my favorite teacher at that time. She was my second grade teacher. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then later she was like my, my fifth grade teacher. And she was the, like the youngest teacher in school. And I, in fact, I did a long monologue, one of my absolute favorite monologues about Miss Sweeney, about uh -huh. you know me being madly in love with her and offending her uh, later on in the school term, and her chastising me, and I, my world just crumbled. Uh -huh. And I fantasized throwing myself in front of a bus, and <laughs> and at the last minute she, because uh, I had all these movie fantasies going, and at the last minute she comes in. Um, and I die, I die before she can get there because <laughs> she's <laughs> rushing to see her, to, to say goodbye to her favorite pupil. And I go 
it's too soon, and I say, tell Miss, my last words are, tell Miss Sweeney goodbye, you know, and I, <laughs> I go. So what was high school like then? I was very popular. I was voted most popular girl. Wow. I was a cheerleader. Um, I don't know. I can't see you as a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader. Well, okay, we I believe we you. But we weren't this kind of a cheerleader. We were, like, really soulful. Oh, we had yes, get down cheerleaders. Oh, yeah, it was Detroit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, so... But sometimes in high school is when it begins to occur to us, like... That you're gay or, or... Gay or who we are or... And even in terms of what we're going to do, like what we're going to do next. Well, but, you know, but uh, maybe what's your family? If you see, my, was your family blue collar? Yeah. I don't think you, you, what your family... What, see, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't have too much struggle. Uh, I used to make the joke that in our neighborhood, you know, uh, your parents were happy if the boy didn't go to jail and the girl didn't get pregnant. Right. And well, we had no a, expectations either. For, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That I, so college was not like they were all going, go to college, go to college, right? No, but you had to do something. Right, exactly. So how would you decide what to do? Well, um, I, a lot of stuff happened to me just kind of circumstantially. You know, mm -hmm. I, uh, I w when I was in college, I was in pre-med, which was kind of a joke. Really? Well, I had a certain inclination towards yeah. certain sciences, but nothing, I couldn't do anything very abstract. I mean, I would be terrible in chemistry or, or some really advanced mathematics. I was good at bi bio biological sciences and anatomy and things like that. You know, I'd done quite a bit of study on anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so that didn't work. I left because I got in a school, uh, a college show, and I was such a hit huh. that I uh, said, oh, I'm going to go to New York because I was not a good student. So you were in college and said... I give up. I'm not staying in college. I'm well, going I, to New and York. people responded so much. I did a monologue, you know, uh, in a college show, uh -huh. and it was so much more contentful and interesting than anything else. The kids they were doing all very collegiate kind of stuff, like a takeoff on gun smoke or a, right, you know, that kind of so thing. So, is this intentional in terms of a monologue? Because so much of the work that we've seen you do later, it's it's very beautifully crafted. I mean, it's. It seems to just be coming out of you like you're thinking it up when you say it, of oh course. Oh, my gosh. But it's really crafted, right? And generally speaking, yes, generally. Yeah, the monologues, about, absolutely. But, and, and, but you have to thank Jane for a lot of that. Well, but Jane didn't write your monologue <clears throat> in college. No, but I had an instinct for content or social class or because I had grown up. And my, first of all, my mother's maiden name was Ford, huh. just by coincidence. And, of course, the Fords lived in Gross Point near Detroit. Right. And um, and they had a daughter Charlotte who was my age, and when she made and we never we would never owned a car, huh. you know. Th luckily, probably because my dad would probably have gotten in an accident. Right. But he used to pay. He'd say, "I'll pay that old boy to drive me to the track." <laughs> <laughs> you have to, you know, you know the color of all that of of being with Southern people, and uh, I mean to me, I it's like a, it's just it's totally a totally a culture, and you and you love the way it goes and the way it talks and the way it does everything, prepares food. Uh, so my dad would always be paying somebody, you know, he was a factory worker. He made like, if he made a hundred dollars a week, I'd be surprised. And he'd pay some old boy, he'd say, I, he, I never even knew the guy's name. They'd always be called some old boy. <laughs> 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 I'm going to pay that old boy from work to drive me to the track. And of course I'd go with him. Uh -huh. And I used to book his bets. So, you know, I'd wait during the evening uh, because my dad would always play to win. And right. Bless his heart, you know. He'd <laughs> you mean seldom, not to place, not to show, but yeah, only to win. Yeah, only to win, and oh. he'd always play the favorite, mm -hmm. and he'd throw a hundred dollars on a on a horse because he'd always had a role. You know, he'd either be flat broke or he'd have a couple thousand dollars, uh -huh. and he'd be into the bookie too, probably. You know, because uh -huh. I have I do recall as a child, late night phone calls that were sort of scary to my dad, and they were that probably his bookie. Money, yeah. 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 Anyway, um, so you were doing a monologue. That's where this I was. Yes, I was, I was doing. So that monologue. Well, that was just. Uh, I could ad lib on a certain comedic level, but I cannot ad lib on a certain literary level that uh -huh. Jane is capable of writing. Sure, you know. But much it's interesting because you got such a such a a, a a response. I did. That it changed your whole life. Yeah, it did. It, I mean, they were so enthusiastic, and I did an upper class woman, a gross point matron who's talking about, I didn't finish about my mother being named Ford, so I borrowed it, and during Charlotte Ford's debut preparations, which were reputedly to cost 250000 which, and this is like 50 years ago, uh -huh. she, that would be like, what, $5 million, some right, extraordinary right. amount of money. 
And uh, my mother said, oh, I just wish I could. <laughs> this is when newspapers had society <laughs> columns. She said, oh, I just wish I could see those preparations at the Gross Point Estate. So finally, I, re I borrowed an old car, a 49 Ford. And the, honest to God, the driver's side tied the door <laughs> shut with a rope, you know? They had to tie it <laughs> shut. And I said, Mom, if we get stuck out in Gross Point, it's going to be really embarrassing. But so we go out, and sure enough, there's cars just driving around the estate, <laughs> trying to see the twinkle lights <laughs> and the canopies. And, and so uh, my mom got a look, and she was satisfied, <clears throat> and then jumped forward a few years. And I went to school with the young woman who became Henry Ford's widow. Wow. And so the last time I was uh, out there <clears throat> with her, we called my mom, and she said, Mrs. Tomlin, you can come in the front door now. <laughs> so it's all, it's all colorful. It is colorful, but it's I, but it's interesting the things to me the inter it's interesting to me the things that we're going this way, yeah. and then something happens and now we're going this way, right. and it's either you know fate or intentional or I don't know some combination. You had to go <coughs> through something thinking, oh, I'm going to New York now. Well, when you're young, I think when you're young, you think. And plus, I, Holly Go Lightly had come out that year in 62. <laughs> right. And I had a lot of Holly Go Lightly damage. You know, uh -huh. I thought you go to New York, you live in a brownstone. <laughs> I didn't know that's what they were called, really. And you have a tree in front of your house. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you go to the restroom, you get $50, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I thought, and so I go to the, th I borrowed, I literally at this juncture, when I decided to, after midterms, I decided to go to New York, I borrowed $5 from nine friends. Wow. And you could get a, a, a non-scheduled prop flight in those days from Detroit to New York for fifteen dollars wow. on Continental. Uh huh. So um, when I they, did that. And they stewardess still wore gloves. Probably. Yeah. And they not to wear red lipstick. Remember, no, they're no, supposed no. to remind people of blood. Right. They had oh, to yeah. wear like light pink or something. <laughs> um, anyway, I get I and I bought a white trench coat, kind of cream-colored trench coat like Holly had in. Uh, Tiffany's, uh -huh. and uh, and remember, uh, I wish I brought a picture because you'd see that hot, that Audrey Hepburn damage. I had big sunglasses like this, and then I would, and she, you know how she had her hair up on top of her uh -huh. head, kind of like uh -huh. Nefertiti in a way. She'd have all this hair wound up, and so, and then she'd have a babushka tied over and tied around in the back, and with these big sunglasses, and and I had the perfect outfit. I went to New York in the summer, of, the spring or summer, near summer, like April or May, whenever midterms are over. And, um, and I went up to live, with, I'd known this girl just slightly in college, in, in, at Wayne State where I was going. Uh -huh. And when I got there, uh, she was living in a railroad flat on, fifth, on Second Avenue between uh, Fourth and Fifth, or Third and Fourth, I forget. And she was living there with this painter. And Franz Klein had died that summer of 72. Uh -huh. uh, and he, was, he had painted these huge black and white canvases. He thought he was carrying on Franz Klein's work. <laughs> <laughs> and they hated each other, and all they'd written, they'd written, cur cursed each other out in, you know, along the, the above the, uh, like this wainscoting here, like they, and, and so I came in all perky, you know, with this trench coat on and these sunglasses, and with about, I had, I think I had $20 or $25 left out of my 45, and um, so I, maybe not that much even, because I spent it all on dinner the next night. <laughs> <laughs> and then I didn't have a red sand and neat. And I wow. found out later when I, when I, years later, I found out she was very depressed when I got there and she smoked Luckies and everything. And uh, she dropped out of school. She was going to Columbia. And she'd been pregnant, had a child, and had given it a, the, oh, up for wow. adoption. But you didn't know. I didn't know. And so, me, though, I'm all ready just to take on the world. And I start pulling up linoleum and, <laughs> and I was going <laughs> to paint the kitchen and somehow get rid of the roaches. And, uh, <laughs> And, and but the best part was the bo the painter lived he 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 slept all day and worked all night in the living room and if you know a railroad flat there's only a window at the front right and then a little air shaft window at the back and she wouldn't let me sleep on his rollerway because that would be like fraternizing <laughs> and I she wouldn't let me sleep with her because it was a three quarter bed and she just was that she didn't want me to sleep with her <laughs> she never said why but <laughs> other than the size we of the bed we never knew why <clears throat> we never knew exactly why so. Uh, uh, they, uh, I, I was trying to um, um, work. What was it? Oh, oh! So I had to sleep on a footlocker uh -huh. for about a week. I slept on a footlocker with a round top. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was so difficult. So you have no money. You're sleeping no, on a footlocker. Well, I went These so people are so writing I, curse words on the wall against oh, each and, other. Oh, and he's got Farina boiled over on the stove, and she won't <laughs> allow me to speak to him. And uh, 
Oh, those were great days in the East Village anyway. I mean, really fabulous, because uh, it was still, there was just a little hippie enclave, and they were beatnik and, and hippies were coming in, infiltrating, and, and all the, uh, the ethnicities were still there, all the Italians and the S Slovaks. And now, kind of what year are we talking about? 62. Uh-huh. Wow. So then what do you do? I mean, here, so I, I got mean, a job York, right what away. A, what I go, I get the town. newspaper and I, yeah. Saturday night, I walk over, I wanted to get a job as a waitress at the Figaro. Uh -huh. That was my, and to study mime. Uh-huh. And so, because <laughs> I, I was naturally good as a mime. Uh-huh. And so I, when I get there, I, I, that night, Saturday, I get there on a Friday or something, and Saturday we walk over, Jenny and I, to the West Village and we have dinner and I, it cost every cent I had. Oh, wow. at the Figaro and I put my name in of course there was a list this long of girls just like me who wanted a job at the Figaro because that was so hip in those days of course and so I, I thought well we're really in trouble Jenny she didn't have a job and this and that I shouldn't have mentioned her name darn it that's all right no <sighs> one will know all right so um, so I get the newspaper out I wash my hair it's Saturday night right and the, so I get the, the late the Sunday times I go through the want ads and all the typists are paying like $45 a week. I mean, really pretty grim salaries. Uh-huh. And, uh, but I noticed that assistant bookkeepers are making like $85, $90 a week. Uh-huh. And I had some assistant bookkeeping experience. Uh-huh. So I set out for those bookkeeping jobs, you know, and I got on the, is this interesting? It's I get on the Fifth Avenue bus because it used to go uptown because I knew the streets were sequential. And I just made a list, you know, going all the way uptown from like 8th Street to 10th Street to whatever. And I got to uh, the mid-50s uh, at lunchtime. And uh, I got a job. Uh, this was a Monday. I got a job. I worked on Tuesday and I worked on Wednesday. And I got paid that day, Wednesday, for two days' work. And I was making $90 a week. But I bet you didn't stop And it was there. a talent agency. That was the big thing. You I were a bookkeeper for, for uh, a assistant talent? Bookkeeper. Assistant bookkeeper. And the girls at the, and the, the women at the office abused me because I, here I am. I've got this straight kind of, you know, hippie hair and I wear, I'm wearing a t-shirt, a a a striped t-shirt, bateau neck, remember, and a burlap <laughs> skirt. And, Perfect uh, for a mime, actually. And you exactly. Might say. <laughs> well, that was my mindset. And they've got big bubble hairdo and Kimberly knits and great big fingernails. And, and so the, and they so abused me, like they would say, uh, uh, you know, they was, first of all, they, they were from the Bronx. I could not understand a word they said. <laughs> and I'm sitting out being the receptionist and the assistant bookkeeper. And, I would, and they, they had all the, uh, uh, the fellow who ran this place, is, was, he later owned ICM, Marvin uh -huh. Josephson. He was uh -huh. a very big agent and businessman. But at that time, it was a small office, but he handled all these top newscasters. And I used to write all the alimony checks, you know, and then I, I wanted to get home so bad on Fridays because I, I so suffered while I was there. Because you imagine typing on onion skin and then trying to file it. And they're asking you to file it, and the files are so jammed. Well, they and never... remember when you'd make a mistake making a copy? Oh, and you'd and have you had to, to erase each, every, every, put a separate know, paper behind it. no idea no idea. But worse, to give the, the flunky in the office like a stack of onion skin like wow. this and say, file this. And there is no, you can't even get your, you can't even get a knife blade into the file, <laughs> much less another piece of onion skin. So I used to keep them. I read a thing in a magazine about make yourself indispensable. Keep those important papers in your desk, and when they can't find them, you produce it. <laughs> so I did a little bit of that. But the, the epiphanous moment came when uh, Josephson's secretary, uh, who was really uh, uh, very disparaging toward me, both in look and word, and she uh, was sitting there in the bookkeeper's office uh, adding up uh, Marvin's expenses one day, and I'm like Agnes Gooch. I've got these big <laughs> ledgers, and I'm like, come in. and. Uh, and her legs are crossed in the doorway. And of course, I'm just galvanized because I'm, I'm terrified of her. And I don't, I stop, I can't even speak. And finally, uh, the bookkeeper says, she says, let Mary pass. And uh, Florence says, let her speak. She's doing with a pencil, you know, doing the adding machine. She says, let her speak for herself. <laughs> and, and that was it. I said, well, that's it. That's the huh. final straw. I've, I've been beaten to nothing. And I rose up like a phoenix, you know. Huh. And you said, you're not going to do this to me anymore. anymore. I'm out of here. Right. Well, no, I stayed. Well, I did say I, did say I was going to quit. And Gloria said, can you please stay till Labor Day because I'm going on my honeymoon. <laughs> and I said, OK. So are we in mime school at the same time? Uh, or did well, we kind it, of put off those dreams? Well, mime school didn't last I only no. went to mime school three weeks uh -huh. because it was so arduous. <laughs> it was so, and everybody was so good. I mean, there wasn't a person who wasn't brilliant. Huh. And, but they were totally anonymous. Uh -huh. And that really wasn't for me. You know, I was looking for 
some kind of acknowledgement. And so? So, and I liked words much too much. Yes, right, I was just thinking, mime school, no. Although, you certainly have, you know, the, the face and the body for it. And I can, you know, I can indicate objects in the air and stuff like that. I'm not oh, yeah. necessarily really good at this, or, but I can yeah, approximate I've seen, I've certain. I've seen you write a number of post-it notes that actually oh, don't right. seem to be there, you yeah. know. So, it wasn't all a waste, the mime no, school. No, 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 it wasn't. But I got I did I got in a mime show in fact. You did when I went down there to uh, uh, in, uh, audition with my brother for the English cabaret. <laughs> one of the fellows in the audience or watching the auditions was had was a mime and he had a mime show off and that's how I got my equity card. And because uh -huh. I told them my name was Lily Tomlin uh -huh. to be English, that's what my equity card. That's uh -huh. how my name was stuck as Lily. Although I wanted that name anyway. So did you have an idea about how you wanted to be a performer in New York? I mean, it's... Uh, well, the, see, that's part of... Uh, when you and I were talking earlier just about sexuality, and uh, it was sort of like either I was so innocent and have somehow held on to some little nucleus of innocence, it never dawned on me that I couldn't just be anything I wanted. I didn't know there was an ingenue, a leading lady, and a character woman. Uh-huh. Uh, I learned that later, but... Um, so you I, mean the sort of boxes that any box, yeah, any kind of box, uh, a se you know, sexual box, uh, any so kind of political box. So did you have box. a sense about your sexuality though, or was it kind of just? Well, you know, uh, I was very precocious sexually, so uh -huh. I. Um, I don't want to hear about the farm animals, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not anything gonna... else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was forever, you know, either because, why was I? Perhaps psychologists say, well, you know, early on she had a, some, I had some disturbance that I didn't know, why are children, why are young children precocious sexually? Why are they interested in sexual well, things? Well, there must be at I least was five different reasons. Too. I mean, yeah. you know, so sexually active. I mean, because I, I do this in my act sometimes. I talk about when I was about five, I, I, we, we, that's when we had moved up to the first floor from the basement, and I there was a clothes pole. We had clothes poles in our yard where people hung, hung their wash, uh -huh. and I could go out the dining room window and shinny down the the clothes pole. See, and I discovered if you hum, you if you humped the pole, it was just <laughs> fabulous. And I thought it was a game. I think I there's a lot of firemen that actually have found that out. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> we lived right, a fire hall was right across the alley from us, and I used to see the firemen up on the roof with. Couple of the older but that is interesting. Whether that's building. an aspect of being, f you know, sort of free, physical, yeah, in a lot of different ways, right? You know, because I can imagine the village during those times was also seen to be very open, yeah. You know, very free. Everybody sort of doing anything they wanted and every body they wanted, I guess. So, I mean, that's what people imagine anyway. It sounds yeah, like a good time. Was it a good time? Uh, I think it was sort of. I was pretty. Uh, I, I'm not uh, I'm not promiscuous or anything like uh -huh. that. It's not my nature to be, uh, you know, just to right pick up with anybody. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I once gave a magazine interview where I said, "Well, I never slept with anyone I didn't know." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And I thought you have to take that right back because <laughs> people will not understand that, you know. So, the, but the performance part of it, I'm also interested in, in terms of h how do you then move into were sort of the next phase of your life. Where um, did we leave off? I forgot. Well, we were we were in mime school for three weeks, and we just quit. Oh our yeah, and then I got job. in the mime show and got my equity card and right. all that stuff. Equity card. Uh, I don't know. I just always I was forever trying to build a monologue. Uh, you know, everybody else had a persona uh, who were, who was doing stand up, but it was too phony. I could you know, it was like, uh, mo and most there was only a handful of women doing stand up right. really. Uh, because women didn't, uh, I, in fact, I have a favorite story I tell about that when I was at the upstairs at the downstairs in the review, which Madeline Kahn got me the job. Uh huh. And because she saw me at the improv doing something, and she, uh -huh. and I went and auditioned. Okay, so there was a girl in our show, one of the shows I did there, who was an ingenue, and she couldn't be more boring on stage. I mean, it was just like <laughs> awful. And so, but in this dressing room, she was hilarious. You know, she'd tell me stories and she'd act them out or characterize them, and. I'd say, and I'd be screaming, and I'd say, you've got to do this on stage. And she'd pull herself up, and her hair would get really huge, you know, and, and uh, she had a fur coat and everything, and she'd say, oh, I wouldn't want anyone to think I was unattractive. Oh, and that wow. was really the truth, uh -huh. you know. You either were supposed to be fat or scatterbrained or, uh, you know, didn't have any, you didn't have big breasts, you didn't, something you played on uh, if you were uh, doing a stand-up, generally speaking. Uh, usually kind of demeaned yourself in some way. And um, 
and most of the guys were sort of demeaning women too. So, so right, it was, so it was, so it was, it was a, a whole club of that. Yeah. So were there venues? I mean, you people just went and you did your thing? Or well, did I'd go you the improv to? a lot. Right. I mean, I'd go the improv. And then I had to have people vouch for me. I had to ask, have some of the boy comics vouch for me. Wow. That I was going to be funny. And uh, the first time I went to the improv, Bud Friedman even tells about this, who was the owner. He, I, uh, I used to have a lot of old antique clothes, you know, from the thrift shops and uh -huh. everything. And so I finally got a spot, and I said, I have to go on at 9.30. And, uh, and I just was insistent about it. And so I wore a big, you know, I used to have this blue velvet halter cut dress on the, on the bias, and I always had ankle straps. In fact, those first ankle straps Ernestine wore were a pair I had in my <laughs> closet, you know. Uh -huh. And I had a big white, real ratty white fox fur. In the night, they looked okay, but in the daytime, you could see they were from a thrift shop, and they were really bad, moth-eaten. Uh -huh. So I go, I get all dressed to go to my gig at the improv that night, and I take, a, I take the subway uptown to mid to the theater district, and I knew the limos are always sitting out there waiting for pay, you know, clients. And so you give, in those days, you could give them 10 bucks, and they'd take you somewhere, as long as they could get back by 10 or 10.30. Uh -huh. So uh, I get a guy to drive <laughs> me over to the improv, and the improv had a big plate glass window at that time. So anybody that came up, you could see them come into the, into the, the room. And I pulled up, and I swept out in this this blue velvet thing and all that, and big white fox furs. And I <laughs> went in, and I went on, and I swept right out and got in the limo and left. You know, so it was. So nobody knew why you had to be on at 9:30, but you did. No, I did, sure. But I'm saying so it made a. It was kind of, that was part of the fun of it, you right. know. And I've always dressed up. I was. I always loved stunts. You know, I would if we had Broadway shows, I would dress up. Uh huh. The first time I dressed up, the first show we had, Jane and I had in '77. We opened it, the box office opened like in February or something. It was very cold. And in those days, so many years ago, fans were very young and they would be in sleeping bags waiting to get, trying to get front row seats and all that stuff. And so I go out there as Mrs. Beasley, you know, as a Red Cross volunteer. <laughs> and I had a, you know, a big veil like a, from the 40s uh -huh. <laughs> and the cape, you know, thrown back like this. And we had an ambulance on site in case there were any, any, uh, fatal, any injuries. Uh -huh. And, um, and I spent the whole day serving coffee and donuts and, and Kleenex because everybody's nose is running, you know, and the hope, and it's just the fun of it. And people who are fans are terribly into it. You know, they, they say, oh, Mrs. Beasley, I'm so glad you and Harold were able to, you know, revive your marriage. <laughs> Your marriage. Well, the characters that you built, I mean, they're so real to people. I don't have to tell you. Yeah, they're it's real to me, It's just exactly too. what you're talking about. But the first time I saw you, and I don't know whether this, where this connects in time with now you're doing stand-up at the Improv, but I saw you on Steve Allen's show. Yeah, well, that's the first time I ever was on, t no, either, it was the second time I was on television. And that, I don't even remember what years were Had we Had to under. be like 68. Yeah. 60, somewhere, because I... Because he had, a, you know, like the most popular variety show or whatever yeah, they called right, it. Yeah, right, right. Uh, of anybody, and he said, oh, well, here's, you know, a, a new talent, and we just want you to see her, and it seems to me you did a monologue under a hairdryer. I probably did uh, Madame Lupe, the old, world's oldest living beauty expert. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I, I mean, you know, it was totally accidental, but obviously... But it was memorable. a good monologue, because, you know, she rejuvenates her face, and then she sneezes, and it all falls down again. <laughs> Because I was also, you know, I was conscious of the, the double standard uh, for women's looks and youth and beauty and how, and of course, in all the, the big beauty leaders at that time, Estee Lauder and Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein, they were like in their 80s. <laughs> <laughs> you never saw them, you know, in their uh, in their true form. You only right. saw old pictures, or Helen. In Helena's case, you only saw her hands going, you know, with those big <laughs> rings. Uh, so I was mad for that stuff. Mad for anything social like that. Um, well, it was just. But I wanted to be fun. I wanted to be informed and funny. But you were funny in a very different way. I mean, I remember feeling kind of ambivalent because it was so funny. And I laughed every second, which I always do when you talk. But somewhere inside, something is going, this is also very poignant, I think, without thinking about it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. some, some combination, your whole show is like that, really, um, and other things you've done. And I, it's a very special persona, I think. Uh, well, I, 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 I don't know what to say about it. I, you know, I, uh, I did, and then later I took a big leap up when I was uh, with Jane, when I am with Jane. I am with Jane. Now, how did I you want meet people out there to know that. <laughs> yeah, it's 20-something. enough of those calls. It's a lot of years, right? <laughs> what? A lot of years. 
Oh yeah, 37 years Jane oh, and I have been wow. together. March 31st. Can I ask you how you met? Yeah, we, uh, we actually had a mutual friend and, um, and she uh, introduced us in New York and Jane showed very little interest in me. So uh, then, I, then I happened to see JT, which she had written in 69. Uh -huh. And let's see, so this was 70. I must have met her in 70. And then she came out to work on my Edith Ann album in 71. Uh, so in, she had had a show on, in 69, but I saw it in re After I met her, I was just mad for her. So I was doing every, I was trying to learn everything I could about her. And I, and I knew she had won a Peabody for this uh, teleplay mm -hmm. called JT. And I got a copy of it, or I saw it in a rerun, because it reran for like 25 years mm -hmm. at holiday time. So, and I was so taken with it because it was, uh, it was every, it's everything that the way she writes. Mm -hmm. It's tender. It's satirical. It's uh, it's in, it's intelligent. It's uh, edgy. It's uh, it's uh, glow. It kind of has a, a, a huge human view, and uh, and the characters are every and every line is like a perception. And yet it seems naturalistic, uh, and it moves the plot forward and the characters forward. And it has a and an imaginative, uh, you know, like in JT, he he has a he he befriends a stray cat who's got a bad eye, and he builds a little house for him out of an old abandoned uh, oven, you know, like an oven, mm -hmm. and he puts an umbrella over the top of it. And uh, he's and the, this is way back in '69, so mm -hmm. he was being bullied by some you know neighborhood toughs, but he was only about maybe ten. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it won a Peabody, and it was very critically received, and, and I thought, oh, if only I could make Edith like this, mm -hmm. Edith Ann. Now, where did, wait, let me just put a comma. Edith Ann was your invention, but for what? Laugh-In. For Laugh-In, that's what yes. I thought. So now you're in regular television. Yes. And, but you and want I'm famous. to, and you're famous. That's, that's an interesting change, isn't it? I mean, you weren't famous. You were doing stand-up. You got more famous. Yeah. Did well, you, I got on Laugh-In. That's what made Did you audition for Laugh-In? Did somebody come and get you? Well, they saw, I, I started doing the, the Merv Griffin show in New York right, in 68. Right. And, uh, right. and I did several monologues, and I would buy the monologue. I'd take the money from the show, and I'd buy the monologue. Huh. So I'd have the film, you know. Uh-huh. And he would let unknown people, you know, he had all unknown kids on in those days. Uh-huh. And, and some, you know, prior would be on too, but lots of people who weren't well known. And uh, I'd go on maybe once a month. So, and I did several of my old monologues on there. And George Schlatter, who produced Laugh-In, right. saw one of the monologues and he gave me, the, may, gave me the offer to go on Laugh-In. But I also had an offer to go on another show called Music Scene, which was like, <laughs> a, it was like the precursor to Midnight Special. Uh -huh. And I thought that was much hipper, you know? I thought Laugh-In was square. Uh -huh. And uh, I didn't want to be on TV anyway. I wanted to be a stage actress. Sure. So, um, <laughs> and uh, so then of course later I did a television special, Lily Sold Out, because <laughs> I was only too exactly. eager to do so when the right opportunity came. So Jane wasn't writing for you then? Not at that moment, no. So not. did Edith Ann come at really out of you? Or did the characters yeah, I wanted come to do, out of I you? Yeah, I wanted to do an Edith, I wanted to do a child on Laugh-In. I came on Laugh-In mid-season. Music scene failed. And, uh, and we did concerts with Janice and Jimi Hendrix and everybody. It was like totally hip. Uh huh. And, but the parents, you know, this was uh, 69, 69. And parents hated it. They mm -hmm. didn't, they, in prime time, they too saw dangerous. They were too doper, long hairs right, and all right. that stuff. And um, so I, so fine, and I had the, so I, the offer came again to go to Laugh In. So I went and met with George, and he so understood me, or seemed to that I went on the show. You know, other people I'd show them different characters and they'd like, uh, they'd kind of move their chair back 10 feet. <laughs> you know, really, or they'd press that buzzer on the floor and say, I have to take this. <laughs> and and I've, right. left, I've left oh, those. Oh, I think I, this one I'll wash my hair, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this one I, I go to, uh, I, I can remember sobbing in a phone booth, you know, going, leaving a, an interview, uh, uh, an audition for uh -huh. the D Dick Cavett show in the early days. Right. And, uh, and I was doing Lupe, Madame Lupe or someone like that. And they, uh, and they just, <laughs> people started, they, they had brought in the office people to watch, you know, to see if I was funny. And the office people started leaving, you know, one at a time. They'd just drift out and then pretty soon it's just me and the guy there. And he, and he gets a phone call and went, oh, I was just so humiliated. And I went out in the, 
in the lobby of this building and you know went in the phone booth and just sobbed crying and another time I auditioned for a uh, uh, Chuck Grodin who later was uh, play uh, he was um, played my husband in the incredible shrinking woman and I right. adore him but he didn't I was unknown and I went and auditioned for lovers and other strangers uh -huh. Renee's and uh -huh. Joe's uh, sure. thing and uh, and who knows what the hell I was doing <laughs> I was not an experienced actress, you know, I mean, I made up my own stuff, right. but it's very different from taking somebody else's idea and trying to figure out what, and this was the one where the girl is listening for like about five minutes, her boyfriend, her fiance, they're supposed to get married the next day or some, or next, and she's saying, and he's saying, I, he's telling her all the reasons that, that he doesn't want to get married, and at the end, all she's doing is listening, and at the end, she just says, did you pick up your tux? <laughs> so you can imagine for five minutes what I must have been doing to yes, try right. to draw attention to myself. <laughs> And Chuck comes up to me, he pulls his chair up, and he says, Honey, have you ever acted before? <laughs> oh, and that's another sobbing in the phone booth episode. Oh, there must be a few of those. Oh, yeah. But on Laugh-In, all of a sudden, the thing took off. And well, there was were the right show for me because yeah. it did those kinds of vignettes and, and character, you know, comedic, farcical characters. And so I took, I took Ernestine there, and she was an immediate sensation. And, uh, and then when I came back in the fall, I introduced Edith Ann. Uh-huh. And I just wanted to, you started asking me how I did, Edith, and I just started doing a kid. I wanted to do a kid, so I would go to the Ice House in Pasadena, uh -huh. and I would improv Edith. And I'd tell the audience to ask me questions. Uh -huh. And I slowly develop, you know, built her, her voice, her but persona. But you were saying that you wanted Jane to help that build that character. Alba, yeah, to, I wanted so to be more. So was this just a kind of a come on to get Jane more into your life, or? Oh, yeah, well. Lo mostly, yes. I mean, I was okay, looking for some know. connection that, because as I say, she didn't show an inordinate interest in me. <laughs> and um, okay. and I had even... We, this is okay because it's not breaking my heart because I know it all turned out Oh, well, it turned but, out great. Yeah. But, and, but listen, I probably, you know, I went to the mat sort of in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, like when we, when our friend introduced us, I was staying at the at a hotel in New York, you know, <laughs> and she brought Jane up for just to meet me in the hotel, and and then I had to go, uh, so go some. I had a, Ernestine's album was coming out right about that time, and so I we went over to Rubens used to be over there by the Sherry Netherland, and it's not there anymore. We went over to that deli, see, and I'm just thinking I have to leave. I have to go on tour. What am I going to do? I, uh, you know, how am I going to uh, get this woman's attention? And uh, so when I got up to leave, I just kissed her, you know, full on the mouth, <laughs> you know, with a certain urgency. <laughs> and I, um, and then I started calling her, and I said, you know, I said, I, uh, you know, I have to, I have to leave town, the day after tomorrow or something. I said, I have to, I have to see you. It was just. Uh, it's like going off to war. Who knows if I'm coming back? You know? Yeah, that's, that's how it felt. <laughs> anyway, I prevailed. I finally, and we just sort of spent the day together and went around and stuff like that. And I'm doing, I probably was so ridiculous Obvious. trying to uh, impress her, mm -hmm. you know, trying to make sure, did, do you know I'm on television? Do you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't think I was saying it that way, but I, I'd bring, be bringing up these obscure things, you know, uh, trying to uh, make her draw me out on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so later, uh, you know, so she did come and help me work on the Edith Ann album. And, and you became a couple very, very soon. So we had the same sensibility, and plus she's from Tennessee, so she knows that whole Southern culture. And um, So was that ever an issue for you, Lily? I mean, I know that a, a lot of people are like, this is my private life and, you know, really nobody's well, business. Well, in those, in those early days, you know, I'd, we'd have people, when we were doing specials for the networks and stuff, I've even had a good girl, a, one of the writers on the show said to me, I think you and Jane should come to work for, in different cars. Oh, wow. And I said, I said, why would we do that? You know, she says, she was just kind of like, you know, this and that and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that didn't matter. That would be about like 73. But did it kind of give you, I mean, it. <sighs> well, it was, diff it was difficult in the sense that we weren't, we were certainly not closeted in our personal lives. Uh, but, and people didn't write about, you know, it was, right. the culture was not tabloidized then. And so, and plus we did good work, and I think people, it was like they were going to leave us alone in a certain way, because we didn't really seek out anything uh, sensational, we didn't do anything sensational, we were pretty, you know, normal people. Right. And, uh, and so even as time rolled on, I just said this recently, in and in I did a press interview the other day for Canada, and I said I was a little jealous of Ellen, 
because she got to come out in that in such a big way, you know. Uh -huh. And I was here so long, so long, and and I and I did I would do different, but it was like even if I and I always referenced Jane, but nobody ever wrote about it, and I kind of they kind of had me on the fence, you know. Well, how mm -hmm. much are you going to take me, or not? And mm -hmm. and the, the time was just different. I can remember being on Carson's show in '73. And he said to me, knowing full well, he said, "Well, you don't have you. Don't you want any children?" <laughs> and you could hear the audience stop dead. Mm -hmm. You know, because just to, even to say you didn't want children, right. as a female, was a heavy, a heavy uh, statement. And I said, I got out. Of, I, I mean, I lightened it by just saying, I said, I said, I really like children. You know, I said, but frankly, I don't really want to have any children, and I don't feel like raising any children, rearing any children. I said, by the way, who has custody of yours? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you know, just to be funny, but. Uh, well, but people are not, it's an interesting thing. That I don't I think, think I would have, I mean, I probably, I would have been a good mother in the sense that I, because I, it would be, if I, if I had a child, I would have devoted myself to the child. I mean, I would have really, uh, you know, but I probably wouldn't have been happy to give up a lot. No, there's always that sort of conflict, but then I think life takes us where we're meant to be. That's sort of my basic yeah. thought because I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what the life not lived or yeah, exactly. what could have been, especially if it's a good life, you know, that we're in. Right. Um, because you, I mean, you became a big star. Not that that's a great life for everybody, but it seemed to be a good life for you to be yeah, very. It, because you were popular for good work. I mean, it yeah, wasn't and, just personality. And, and, uh, personality and when you thing, do comedy, you know? I think people, yeah. uh, you, if people do like you, they have a real affection for you. Right. Because they've, they've had a lot of enjoyment from you. And you really share something. Because uh, I was talking with Rob here backstage, you know, and he brought up a, just a little phrase of Ernestine from, an old, from, one, from, one of her, from her album. And, uh, and it makes you, you know, just the recollection of it makes you laugh. And it's not a funny line per se, but in Ernestine's mouth and in the context, and I have a fan who emails me all the time, and I tell you, he can make he can write a whole letter that's relevant <laughs> using old lines and phrases from bits. He is huh. so he's like a, a walking uh, you know library huh. of stuff. Well, people do love it so much. I mean, that, it's an interesting thing about celebrity or fandom, or I don't even know what you'd call it. That sometimes it's really deep. You know, it means a lot yeah. to people the work that you do and the people that you are. And I think, and I say the people that you are, because, yeah. you, you know, you are a lot of people for people. Yeah, right. Um, and, and if they don't like one, maybe they'll like the other one. Exactly. <laughs> well, you give us a great variety. I mean, in your show, for instance, now, how long after Laugh-In was um, Well, Laugh-In went off in 73, so then we did Appearing Nightly first in 77. Right, right. And uh, that sort of legitimized me, you know, because I play, I opened on Broadway, and, it, and that was a, a, that show was a success. Right. Um, but in those days, I was really rigid in my, you know, what I thought were my, were my integrity. Uh -huh. And so I had said to Jane, we need to go to New York and play a theater so I don't have to do one-nighters all the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we, we did. We, so, we, that, so Jane helped, you know, we took material we had and everything, and we began to put, and we had new stuff, and we put a show together. And she said, well, you've got to have a title. You know, because it was really just like me doing a certain m a number of vignettes and all. But she said, "You see, she's so smart. She just knows. She's so s and met, uh, the simplest little thing. She's, you've got to have a title. That's the only way people understand that it's that it's more that it's more theatrical." <laughs> and so she, uh, and she, and I already made my poster. I was ready to go. See, if, as soon uh -huh. as a theater came available, because they don't like to give limited runs a theater because. Right. So I only I only announced for four weeks. Uh huh. And then when we were such a hit, I mean, we were just a huge hit, and uh, we were sold out right away. And so the, the, pr the promoter comes to me and says, we've got to extend, we've got to extend. I said, no, no, I told them four weeks, and that's it. If, they, if I extend, they'll know I, that I was planning on trying to sell those <laughs> tickets and then sell more. <laughs> and I said, it's just too humiliating. Such integrity. I just won't do it, you know. So finally he says, you've got to do it. People are, the people are begging for tickets and all that stuff. I said, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll extend for four more weeks, and that's it. And I said, and we have to have a tour ready so that they know I'm serious, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure I could have played for a year on Broadway in that I'm first sure. show. But anyway, uh, then we then in, so that was '77, and '85 we did the search. So that it was, was eight years. It, yeah. That's an amazing, that's an amazing piece of work. It is, yeah, and it's Jane's, and, and it's. Um, I mean, I think I've seen it four times mm -hmm. in different cities. Yeah. I mean, when you first opened, I flew to New York and... and Did you? Yeah. And it wasn't cheap, you know, and I thought, well, but I've got to do costly. that. And I didn't know you. And I really do owe you. Uh, yeah. Right. 
<laughs> no, I owe you. But it was, it, it's such an undertaking to kind of, I, I don't know, do you intentionally kind of wrap your head around what's happening currently and comment on it? I, it's, just, it's kind of a stupid question. I don't even know no, how to no, ask it. No, no, it's not. Of course it is But isn't. it just seems like you put your finger on so much stuff that's, you know, like your line about cynicism. Oh, well, that's which, a great line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everybody... The line is, no matter how cynical you become, it's never enough to keep up. That's, uh, that's Jane's, of course, that's Jane's line. And, and Ted Koppel must have used it 10 times on Nightline, you know, over the years. Well, somebody quoted you the other day and didn't and know who say, had said it. As I, mean, to, says, I don't mean on television. I mean, to, you know, just oh, at, yeah. wor at work. Uh -huh. He always said, as Lily said. He would, yeah, and I'd have to write him and say, you know, this is Jane's line from The Search for Sign, blah, blah, blah. And next time, a couple years later or 18 months later, he'd use it again and he'd say, as Lily Tomlin says. <laughs> <laughs> and you did films, too. I mean, for a person who wanted to be, you know, legitimate on the Broadway yeah, stage. I'm, that harks back to that leading lady uh, character woman, et cetera. It never dawned on me I couldn't be in the movies. <laughs> you know, so when I, and especially being on a show like Laughing and doing characters like Edith, like Ernestine and stuff. People just, that's why Altman is probably the, the one, he gave me the job because he probably never saw Ernestine. Well, there was no Ernestine in Nashville, that's true. No, no, that's right. <laughs> and now that was, an, that was extraordinary. Yeah, too. and I got nominated for that, but the, so how could you, how lucky or could you get to the first time on film to get in Alt, one of Altman's movies? And, uh, and I've generally been better in Altman's movies than other movies, or because he allowed us to be freer. You know, mm -hmm. he's much more, uh, improv oriented. He would say, in fact, uh, oh, you know, uh, Gary Trudeau spoke at, at Robert's uh, memorial in New York and he said, I'm asking, I'm writing pages and pages of script every day and then I see it evaporate into improvisation. <laughs> and I say to, to, to Altman, I'd say, why am I writing these, these, all these pages of script? And Altman says, you write the script so the actors know who they are. Mm -hmm. See, and then mm -hmm. we could take off from it. And he's absolutely right. Right. But, but you don't but get directors that was, like that to work with. No, I no, mean, not very often. You can no. make 100 movies and you'd only get two like that. Unless yeah. it was the same, unless you're part of a, somebody's stable, which, you know, some, some actors get yeah. to be. But that was, so what was the most rewarding of anything you done? Search. I think because it was, you know, we made a real point of trying to have Jane acknowledge because when, when you're, uh, when she's working with someone like me who's so far out front and who's been doing this kind of thing and, be, and I have a certain kind of ease doing it, uh, like you saying, it sounds like it's coming out of you, you know, right. at the moment, which it couldn't be further from the truth. And uh, so we, we said, how are we gonna make Jane be, be acknowledged as she should be? And she still hasn't been, but, so we created the logo for the play with her name so it could never right. be published without right. her name there, you know. But I always, I dominated the, uh, the equation when you'd be out in the public like that. Well, but it's something both of you had to expect, right? I mean... Uh, well, I worried about it. Uh, I probably, it ha probably was uh, uh, more than she expected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> more than she might have wanted, you know. Because she's, she's extremely happy right now because we're, we're part of this new website, you know, called wowowow.com. Uh -huh. uh -uh. And it's... Um, it's created by, it's for women uh, of a certain age, uh -huh. as they say, although I think we're getting a broader audience <laughs> we're, than we're that. We're truly certain about our age. Oh, oh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so the, uh, and, and it's founded by Liz Smith and, and S Leslie Stahl and um, Peggy Noonan and Mary Wells of Wells Rich and Green, who, you know, uh -huh. who is a huge advertising uh, and success. And what's the website? It's, it's just for, it's about women politics, talking, sharing things, you know. It's, uh, and so Jane, like just today, Jane posted uh, some eco ca cartoons. Uh -huh. She does, because she can do anything, uh -huh. you know, and you never know what she's up to. She, uh, she's up there and I, ha and I have, and of course I'm like her worker bee. I'm forever like cleaning <laughs> up the paste and, and, and trying to, and keeping track of the little pieces of stuff she cuts and pastes together. And I used to make the joke, you know, about, uh, I always wanted to, here's, here's what I wanted to do, but I'm so physically different than she is. I wanted to do a one-woman show where I play her. Uh huh. You know, but it's so different than she is. I, I, you know, and then I, and then I would be off stage talking to her, sometimes. Or Maybe it doesn't matter that you're different. I know. I, but the, the charm of her is this. It's hard to. It, you can't depict it. And she's much more charming than I am. I mean, she has a real, uh, you know, a real kind of southern. Um, I don't know, because people like she. She'll go to dinner maybe once out of forty times. You know, with friends, uh -huh. 
and uh, and I'm the one that has to always show up and keep the date. Yes, of course. And uh, <laughs> and so she, because we call her Maybe Jane. Everybody calls her Maybe Jane. You know, well, who's going? Well, uh, so and so and so and Maybe Jane. <laughs> so that's her nickname, Maybe Jane, always. And or like, here's what she'll do because she reads, she knows everything that's going on. She'll say, "Oh God, we've got to get tickets for uh, like G when Gordon Liddy and Timothy Leary were going around together and they were uh -huh. going to play Royce Hall." She says, "Oh, we've got to go see them. We've got to go see." This is 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, so I say, "Okay." And I try to. They're sold out. I'm trying to get tickets, <laughs> and I work like hell to get tickets. I get four tickets finally, uh, and I invite two other people to go with us to see this. And the night of. I'm at the bottom of the stairs, and I say, you got to get ready. We're going to Royce Hall tonight to see Gordon Liddy and Oh, she says, I don't want to go tonight. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just that simple. So the three of us, the other three Sounds of us. Sounds like go. it works, though. Oh, yeah. No, no. We, you know. Um, and, oh, what I really meant to say was, yeah. like, this, like, so here I show up all the time, so nobody could, they couldn't be less interested when I show up again. <laughs> but when Jane shows up, uh -huh. oh, this is an event, you know. I think it's very sweet. No, it's great. It's wonderful to... Uh, but I, it's, uh, I mean, it's wonderful that, you know, that, but she has that quality that they are right. yearning to see her anyway. I understand. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, we've got three minutes left in the show. And yeah. I would be remiss you if I kidding. didn't say. Yes. Is there anything that you thought you were going to say to me? I mean, I don't think you planned anything. But uh, at the end, you would say to me, oh, I wanted to talk about X. So I don't know. Is there anything? Well, we're, Jane and I are uh, kind of, we're, we're sort of, in name producers of this off-Broadway show, Bebo Brinker's Chronicles, based uh -huh. on the Ann Bannon books. Uh huh. Uh, it, oh, it's only playing now till April 27th, I think, at the 37 Arts. And then you think and we're it's hoping to around? expand. We're hoping to expand it into television or movie. Wonderful. You know, because those five, the, Ann Bannon wrote five books. Uh huh. And uh, back in the 50s, you know, uh -huh. in early 60s, and we think they have a tremendous potential for for showing just what the politics were like in those days and the culture and everything else, you know? And they're quite funny. They can be quite funny, too. I think and it's They're great. kind of steamy off-Broadway, you know, because these girls sort well, of... Well, you can be, sort of. Yeah. You know. Listen, I have had a wonderful time. I hope it's been okay. It was well, good for me. I hope it was good for very you. Very good. <laughs> I'm really grateful that you were here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, love cigarette after. All right. No, there's no smoking in here. We don't smoke. And uh, I'm really glad that you could join us because um, there are so many people, you know, in our community, around our community, uh, people you've heard of, people you haven't heard of, and sometimes, occasionally, a fabulously great goddess like Lily Tomlin. <laughs> and so if you've got that goddess in you, you you've got to do this. If you've got uh, that comic in you, you've got to do it. If you're a bookkeeper, be a bookkeeper. Whatever it is, it's really important because this is a woman who's really been true to herself, and I think that is the, the most fabulous thing. So you honor me. Whatever it is, get used to it. <laughs>